Amen. Amen. We're in Genesis chapter number 45 this evening. We've been going through the book of Genesis. Uh, this is actually going to conclude the little uh, um, uh, stratagem, I guess you could call it, uh, uh, that uh, Joseph has been playing out, this little plot that he had, and uh, <clears throat> almost even... To a degree, it's not. It wasn't meant to be a joke, but 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 a prank that he did. Stratagem is probably really the best word. Uh, what he was playing out against his brethren, because uh, of course he did some very bad things to them. Of course, uh, in this chapter, he is finally going to be revealing his true identity to his brethren. That is the theme of this chapter, Genesis 45, where Joseph is going to be revealing his identity unto his brethren. Genesis chapter number 44 ended with the fact. Uh, that Judah was willing to sacrifice himself for Benjamin. Joseph had taken uh, the cup that he drinks out of, and he had taken that cup and put it in the bag of, jo of Benjamin. And he had said that whoever, whoever I find the cup and whoever's sack it is found, you know, that man is going to be staying with me and he's going to be my bondman. He's going to be my servant. Well, they opened it up and of course it was in Benjamin's. And Benjamin had to return. Judah was the one that promised his father he was going to bring him back. You know, of course, he starts begging him, he's explaining the situation, and uh, you can see true repentance in Judah. You can really see true repentance in Judah, and he's begging him, he's begging him, and that's, how, that's actually where it ends. The very last verse, we're going to read that, just to put it back in your mind, remind you. Look at verse number 34 in the preceding chapter. It says this, For how shall I go up to my father and the lad be not with me, lest peradventure, peradventure excuse me, I see the evil that shall come on my father. And the, the, the word evil there means harm. It's talking about, he had just explained that, you know, uh, that uh, Jacob himself had talked about how if he doesn't come back because of the sorrowful, uh, the, 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 the sorrow and the sadness, that it will bring down his gray hairs to the grave. Thinking that through this sorrow, this could kill him. He's going to be so depressed, you know, that he could die. So Judah's just saying, I will do whatever I have to do. He's willing to sacrifice himself for Benjamin. Now, going along with that same conversation, we're picking up here in Genesis 45, verse 1. This is Joseph's response to what he just heard Judah say. This is what happens in verse number 1. It says this, Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by. And he cried, Cause every man to go out from me, and there, and there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. So there, notice it says, Then Joseph could not refrain himself. That means he couldn't hold himself back any longer. He couldn't stop himself, right? Then it goes on and says that he, he couldn't refrain himself before all them that stood by him. So he wasn't able to hold this back with everyone that's in there. And because of that, it says, and he cried. Now the word cried in the Bible, you may or may not be familiar with this, but the kids need to hear these things, need to be reminded of this. It does not mean like we would say, uh, you know, to shed tears, we would normally use the word cry, right? That's how we use it today. Hey, he's crying. We're saying that he's shedding tears. Well, the word, the word in the Bible, cry, it does not mean to actually shed tears. It means to yell every time. That is consistently the definition of the word cry. When it says that he cried, it means that he yelled or he screamed out. It means to lift up your voice, right? When you're talking about shedding tears, that is to weep. It means that he wept. That is, that, that is when you would use a, the word talking about you know, shedding tears, it would be to weep. So he actually does that as well. So notice what it says. It says, and he cried, uh -uh, excuse me, Cause every man to go out from me. So he can't hold himself back. There's all these people around. So because of that, and it's the Egyptians specifically, he cries or he yells out and he says, Cause every man to go out from me. And specifically he's referring to the Egyptians. Because then it says this, And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. So his brethren were there. He was telling everyone else to leave. He couldn't refrain himself he could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. So he couldn't hold it back anymore. He wanted all the Egyptians to leave. And then it says that Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. So he finally revealed who he is. I mean, how bizarre would that be? After this whole fiasco that you had been going through the entire time, you've been speaking to this ruler in Egypt. You haven't seen your brother for so many years. And then this man that you've been standing before, not even a hint, not even an idea that it's him, reveals and says, I am Joseph, your brother. The last time they saw Joseph, they sold Joseph into slavery. When Joseph was 17 years old. 
So this had to have been you know, the least expected situation that you could possibly imagine. And then he tells them, he reveals himself and tells them that he is their brother. Look at verse 2, it says, and he wept aloud. So this is him crying. So he, he also did what we would say cry, right? He did shed tears. It says, and he wept aloud. So he's, he's weeping loudly. And the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. So the, he must have been, uh, you know, uh, crying in our vernacular, we say crying, shedding tears. He must have been crying very loudly to where all of Pharaoh's house, you know, it says, it says the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh, saying all the people that live in his house, they could hear him crying. He was crying so loudly. And of course, he's got tons of emotions built up. I mean, it's entirely understandable, right? Look at verse 3. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. So he's, this is him making himself known unto his brethren. He's telling them, I am Joseph. And then he says, Doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. I mean, it's, when you read this story and you really put yourself in it, I mean, it is hard to wrap your mind around it. It's a, it's a crazy situation. They said that, it says that they couldn't even answer him. They couldn't even respond to him. They were unresponsive, just looking at him in disbelief. It says they were troubled at his presence, just knowing, you know, what did you just say? You're, you're who again, right? This is Joseph, their brother, standing before him. Now, uh, I'm going to, of course, go through the story as usual, and I'm, we're just going to look at, you know, what the immediate application is, but we're also going to look at the symbolism again. There is so much symbolism, and it's there for a reason. It needs to be preached, and it needs to be taught to you, the symbolism of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here we see Joseph making himself known unto, it says, his brethren. I want you to turn with me to Mark chapter number 4, verse number 33. Mark chapter number 4, verse number 33. Now, um, I'm going to allude to a couple of passages that just, you know, pop into my mind here. Number one, you know, the, the disciples were, were oftentimes talking about the identity of Christ. I'm going to turn to this other passage as well. I'm not even going to read it. You know, and they even asked Jesus, you know, who he was one time. Of course, Simon Peter did. Well, well, Jesus asked Simon Peter, who did he think that he was? They were talking about, you know, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Jesus asked uh, uh, the disciples, right? And Peter's the one that responds. He says, you know, some say thou art John the Baptist, some say Elias, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then he says, but whom do ye say that I am? And then, of course, Peter responds and says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So, they spoke about his identity. They spoke about Jesus' identity of him being the Son of God. Now, the definition of what it means to be the Son of God is to be God in the flesh. I'm not going to re-preach that or go through that. But, of course, we, I've shown that from the pulpit numerous times. Everyone uh, is probably aware of that already. That's what that means. That's what... You know, they are saying, they understood that to a degree. Now, does that mean that they fully wrapped their minds around that? Of course not. The Bible says God was manifest in the flesh, and that is what? It says, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. It's a mystery. It's hard to understand, right? So, uh, there, you're in Mark chapter number 4. Mark chapter number 4. I'm going to show you that, that Christ revealed certain things unto his brethren or his disciples that he did not reveal to everyone else. Mark chapter number 4. I want you to look with me at verse number 33. It says this, And with many such parables spake he the word unto them, as they were able to hear it. So notice he's speaking the, the, these parables unto... It's talking about everyone. It says, as they were able to hear it, right? So he's speaking parables. Look at verse 34. It says this now, But without a parable spake he not unto them. That's speaking about his disciples now. And when they were alone... I'm sorry, but without a parable spake he not, and saying he never didn't speak unto them by not a parable. Sorry, I confused that verse. Then it says this, And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. So notice that, that once he was alone with his disciples, what did he do? He no longer spake to them in parables, but he actually spake to his disciples plainly and clearly. And he revealed these things unto who? His brethren. Unto his disciples. So they had a special relationship with Jesus and he would reveal certain things to them specifically. Now I want to look at something that's, that's uh, even a larger revelation that was revealed uh, from Christ. I want you to go with me to John chapter number 14. It's re revealed from Christ to his brethren. 
Of course, we're going to be going back to our text, Genesis 45. So you've got a bulletin or something, you can put that in there while we flip around a little bit. John chapter number 14, Jesus as well reveals his identity unto his brethren. Once you look here at John chapter number 14, Look at, we're going to be, we'll just read the beginning of the whole, the whole chapter here because the whole thing runs together. It says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I wonder what he means by that. Look at verse 2. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I want to focus now on verse 7. Draw your attention to verse 7. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Verse 9. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? So notice here what's going on. Jesus is revealing his true identity unto his disciples. He's, he's revealing his true identity unto his disciples, unto his brethren. Just like what was Joseph doing? Joseph was revealing his true identity unto his disciples. Now, I want to tell you something even more interesting than that. What took place, what has the parallel been uh, uh, prior to this where there was just mass consistency, just a lot of consistency there in Genesis chapter number 43? What did they do in Genesis 43? Does anyone remember that was a parallel with Jesus and his disciples? It was the Passover, right? We saw the parallel of the Passover with the disciples seated with them. They're, they're eating bread, they're making merry, all of these different things, right? Well, when did Jesus reveal his identity unto his disciples? What, you know, what took John 14, what's the timing of this? It's immediately following what? The Passover. Isn't that interesting? We, we go back and we read the story about Joseph. When Joseph reveals his identity and he says, I am Joseph, right? And he shows them who he is. Notice that it was right after that, that story where they sit down. You have Joseph, the picture of Jesus, and then you have also the 12 tribes, which are always paralleled with the uh, 12 disciples constantly o over and over again you can see this talking about the foundations you know of the church is built upon the tw of, upon the disciples and uh, the uh, the apostles they're called talks about you know uh, things in heaven and stuff like that I'm not going to get into all the foundations and stuff like that but yeah there's a major parallel between the apostles and you know uh, the the uh, uh, 12 tribes of Israel there, there's a lot of parallels between them. Go back to Genesis chapter number 45. So we can see the way that Joseph revealed his true identity unto his brethren. He was there with them. You know, they sat down, they ate, they made merry, right? But they didn't fully understand who he was. Kind of like when they sat down with Christ. They knew, hey, he's the Son of God. They understood, you know, uh, you know that he is the Messiah, right? They're sitting down and they're eating, they're making merry, they're having a good time. But they didn't truly understand who he was. And then, you know, of course, in the, the midst of all of them, you know, Philip pops the question, right? You know, and, and, and asks him, you know, uh, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. And then Jesus tells him, you know, have I been so long time with you and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou, show us the Father? That's what he's saying. He's saying there's nothing else to see, right? I am the Father. It's as clear as day. Of course, that's why he's referred to as the everlasting Father. There's only one God, the Father. And the Bible teaches that God was manifest in the flesh. So, the one God, the Father, was manifest in the flesh, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. We see him revealing his identity to his disciples, just like, and his brethren, just like we see Joseph revealing his identity to his brethren, his true identity. Look now with me at verse number 4. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. 
and they came near. So it seems to me like they're standing afar off. They never move closer to him. So he, he's revealing his identity to him. I'm sure they're very apprehensive because of the terms that they left on or they saw him last on. So it says, he says, come near, I pray you. And they came near and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. So they had to repeat it. You know what this reminds me of is Thomas with Jesus, right? You know, uh, Thomas was standing there when Philip asked that question. The disciples were there, right? The 12 disciples. Thomas was one of them, right? Keep reading. Look at verse 5. It says, Now therefore be, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. So it seemed like they were standing before him before and they didn't believe him. They didn't believe that you know, he was Joseph. That's why he had to repeat himself. And when Jesus rose again from the dead and he came back and he, he showed, you know, remember doubting Thomas, he's saying, hey, you know, I'm not going to believe until I, you know, put my fingers into the holes of his hands and I thrust my, you know, fist into his side, right? And then Jesus shows up and he's like, hey, be not faithless but believing, right? And then what does Thomas say? My Lord and my God, right? So he, had to, he saw him that time and then, of course, it really resonated with him at that point. My Lord and my God. Here we see, verse 5, another parallel with Joseph and Jesus. Firstly, of course, it says, Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. So, see, notice that God was working through this. That God had, had a plan from the very beginning. That's why Joseph was receiving these dreams. This dream was about what was going to for to come. This was planned prior, of course. God had a plan specifically for Joseph, that he was going to use Joseph in a great and mighty way. It says to preserve life. And he didn't only preserve the life of the Israelites, he preserved a massive amount of life, right? He, he saved many, many people. He said all the nations, it says, came unto him. You know, and this pictures Jesus. He's not only the savior of the nation of Israel. He's not only the savior of the 12 tribes. You know, he's the savior of all, everyone from Canaan, all of the surrounding nations, the Philistines. They all had to go there and get food. He preserved much life. He's the savior of all men, especially of them that believe. Everyone. He's not only, only Israel's savior. Then look at verse number 6. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years, saying five years to come, in the which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. So this famine is so bad there is no heart. No one is, is gleaning a harvest at all. No one is giving is is you know yielding any sort of return at all. Period. Nothing. You know, there's not going to be earring nor a harvest. Right? We get a timeline here too, because notice it says that they're two years into the famine. Now, if you keep in mind, if you remember, Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh and he he gave the interpretation of the dreams. Right? Well, there was seven years first of abundance, and then two more years. So, how old is Joseph now? 39 years old. So we can get a timeline here. Joseph right now is 39 years old. So they hadn't seen him since he was 17 years old. So that's pretty wild. Look at verse number 7. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth. That's like an offspring. That's what posterity is. In the earth and to save your lives, it says, by a great Deliverance, of course, is a great picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is you know great deliverance. What greater deliverance do we receive? Can could anyone receive than through Jesus, right? But this was a great deliverance as well, and he 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 uh, uh, contributed to bringing about the Messiah because he kept Judah alive. If you think about that, right? Look at verse number eight. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God, <clears throat> and He hath made me a father to Pharaoh. And then it says this, and Lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Of course, Joseph had, he had a massive amount of power. Pharaoh said that there was nobody greater than him, uh, than Joseph, than himself, Pharaoh, and only when he was in the throne. Also, he said. So, you can see here, there he's speaking about the power that he has. And of course, what I think of when it says that, he, that, uh, that he hath made me, he says, a father of Pharaoh, and it says, and Lord. So he made him Lord. That makes me think of the verse in Acts where Peter is preaching to the Jews and it says that he hath made this same Jesus both Lord and Christ. Right? Look at verse number 9. Look at verse number 9 now. Haste ye. That means hurry. Haste ye and go up to my father and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me. Tarry not. 
And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children and thy children's children, and thy flocks and thy herds and all that thou hast. And there will I nourish thee, for yet there are five years of famine." lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. And behold, your eyes see in the eyes of my brother Benjamin that it is my mouth that speaketh unto you. Now keep in mind also that all of this had to come to fruition that God had already uh, uh, prophesied about them going into slavery for 400 years. Does anybody recall when God prophesied of this very early on? To Abraham. Do you remember when Abraham, actually it's right after Abraham's salvation, right? So um, Abraham, at nighttime, he takes you know, the sacrifice and he sets up the sacrifice and then a deep sleep falls upon him. And then at, during that time, it says, in a great darkness, right? A great darkness comes, comes on him and he has this dream or this vision, uh, you know, uh, and he receives the word of God. And God tells him that his offspring, that, that his children, you know, and, and, uh, and the nation that comes out of him is going to go into bondage for 400 years. And that's speaking about what's going on here. So God had already prophesied of this. This is all planned. God, you know, is taking them down there purposely. This whole thing with Joseph going down there and then now saying, hey, now you guys all got to come down too. This is all pre-planned. They wouldn't have been able to survive without going down there. So this is a perfect setup. And then he said, hey, there's five years left. You know, you're, you can't keep it. I'm sure, you know, you think it's only two years now. They already had to make two trips. You know, is that really sustainable where you got to keep going down to Egypt repeatedly to get this food? I mean, that's obviously very hard, a hard way to live. I mean, Egypt is, is a far journey from Canaan. So they're having to, you know, travel this, this far journey. So it's just, it's set up perfectly. Just come to Egypt and I will keep you here. And what's going to, and I'll, I'll sustain you here. And what's going to happen? They're going to stay there. And then they're ultimately going to go into bondage for 400 years. And this was prophesied. So this is all working towards God's plan. <clears throat> Look at uh, verse number 12. And behold, your eyes see in the eyes of my brother Benjamin that it is my mouth that speaketh unto you. And ye shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that ye have seen and ye shall haste and bring down my father hither. Now what's interesting about this is I want to keep the same consistency of the symbolism, right? Um, and, and I believe that that is what's being taught here. Who do the, uh, the other brethren of Israel represent? If we take Joseph of Jesus, who do the other brethren represent? The disciples, right? So notice here what, G what Joseph is doing. What is he doing? He's sending them forth to go to who? To go to his father, go to Abraham, right? Send them forth to go to, I'm sorry, Jacob. To go to Jacob, which would be Israel, and to do what? Go tell them that I'm alive. What is that like? Maybe it's like Jesus when he sent forth his disciples. Hey, go tell them that I'm alive. What's the gospel? The death, the burial, and the power of the gospel is specifically the resurrection. Not only that, something that's very interesting. If you look at verse number 11, it says he wants him to tell his father, tell Israel this, and there will I nourish thee, and there will I nourish thee. Now, there's many chapters in the Old Testament, of course, in Ezekiel, where it talks about Jesus being the shepherd. It talks about him being the shepherd. It talks about the Lord being the shepherd, and that he's going to lead them, right? But, of course, the most famous passage, the passage that I think of the most, is in Revelation uh, chapter number 7, where it says, The Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, he shall feed them. And, and then he, it also says he shall lead them unto living fountains of water. So what is he going to do? He's going to nourish them. The lamb is going to be the one that nourishes them when, they cut, when he comes with Jesus. Right? What did Jesus say in John 14? He says, I go to prepare a place for you. He has everything ready. And we're getting ready to read about it here in just a minute. Joseph makes all the provisions. He gets everything ready for him. What's that kind of like? Jesus, I go to prepare a place for you. And then he sends forth his disciples. Hey, go preach and go tell them that you thought I was dead, but I'm actually alive. Isn't that interesting? And uh, I, I want to keep reading there in verse number 14. Verse number 14, it says, And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them. And after that, his brethren talked with him. So he tells them all of this. I mean, quite a, you know, a, a, a substantial amount of time goes by where they don't say a word. He tells them all this, explains all this to them, and then finally 
he kisses Benjamin and weeps upon Benjamin's neck. Benjamin's weeping upon his neck. He kissed all his brethren. They're all weeping and hugging each other. I'm sure this is extremely emotional, very sentimental and important time for them. And uh, then it says, finally, they talked. So they were, you know, uh, quite literally speechless. They were unresponsive. They just didn't know what to say. And then verse number 16, it says, And the fame thereof was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brethren are come. And it pleased Pharaoh well and his servants. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Say unto thy brethren, This do ye. Laid your beasts and go get you unto the land of Canaan. And take your father and your households and come unto me, and I will give you the good of the land of Egypt. And ye shall eat the fat of the land. Now thou art commanded, this do ye. Take you wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come. Notice that he's making all the preparations. He, these are all the provisions that he is providing. Just like Jesus has all these things provided for us. Uh, remember, uh, and also in the one passage, how Pharaoh is the one that pictures uh, um, the father. Right? Well, here we see, and like we read in John 14, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. He said, in my Father's house there are many mansions. Right? And then, of course, this, this land, if you think of it that way, it's Pharaoh's land. And Pharaoh is helping provide these things as well. I'm not up here teaching that they're two different people. All right? It's just symbolism. Okay? So settle down. You don't have to go to a Pentecostal church around the corner or anything. <laughs> Verse number 22, verse number 21, it says, and the, and the children of Israel, no, we didn't read verse 20 either, did we? Read verse 20. Also, regard not your stuff, for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. I always thought that was interesting. I read that. He's saying, like, your, your, your stuff is in, like, all your possessions. He's saying, don't even, don't even uh, uh, bring your things, all of your possessions. He's saying, just leave them there. So wherever they, li wherever they lived, whether it be tabernacle, whether they had built some homes or anything like that, it's sa he's saying just leave all your stuff there. Your personal possessions. Of course, they bring their sheep because remember they come and they say, hey, we're shepherds and stuff. So they bring that because it, it is their sustenance, their food and things like that. But, you know, they say, you know, they, you know, or I'm sorry, Pharaoh says to them, regard not your stuff. He's like, just leave it. He's saying, I'm going to provide for you literally everything. I'm going to give you everything. He says, for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. So he's going to provide for them. Verse 21, And the children of Israel did so. And Joseph gave them wagons according to the commandment of Pharaoh and gave them provision for the way. So he even provided for them along the way. <clears throat> 22, To all of them he gave each man changes of raiment. And of course, this is just like Revelation chapter number 3. You know, he says, He that overcometh, you know, will I give uh, white raiment. You know, I, I can't remember exactly how it's worded, but he talks about him being, you know, attired or dressed in white raiment, right? Uh, verse, or keep reading there. It says, But to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. He says, The same shall I, shall I clothe in white raiment. That's what he says. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. That's how it's worded. Just in case you were wondering. Uh, verse number uh, 23. And to his father he sent after this manner. Ten asses laden with the good things of Egypt. And ten she asses laden with corn and bread and meat for his father by the way. So he sent his brethren away and they departed. And he, sent, and he said unto them, See that ye, fail, that ye fall not out by the way. And they went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father. Verse 26, and told them, and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive. So this is, keep in mind the symbolism of preaching the gospel. What is, what is the definition of, go, of the word gospel? What is the definition? It's good news or good tidings. Now, you don't think that this was good news or good tidings to Jacob? To Israel, I'm sure he was ecstatic, right? Joseph is yet alive. Joseph is yet alive. Keep reading. And he is governor over all the land of Egypt. What is that saying? What is that, what is that teaching in regards to Jesus? He's Lord of all. You know, that's what the Bible talks about, that, that, that God showed that to the world by the resurrection, that he hath made this same Jesus both Lord and Christ. That's, that is in context speaking about the fact that he raised him from the dead. 
that showed that he was Lord and Christ. It says, in that he raised him from the dead is actually the, 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 the seceding phrase. So, he made him both Lord and Christ in that he raised him from the dead. Saying he showed that to everyone. The fact that he is living and has resurrected, that shows that God made him both Lord and Christ. We see here saying that, hey, Joseph is yet alive. And he's governor over all the land of Egypt. Kind of like, Jesus is yet alive, and what is he? And he's Lord. He's God, right? This is good news. This is good tidings unto him. But there's more. Keep reading. No, notice this. It says, uh, And ja Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, it says, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. Now, I want to point out a couple of things in this passage, too, that's very inter interesting. Notice it says, and they told him all the words of Joseph. So did they just say, hey, these are my words. Let me tell you what I think about this. What does it say? They told him all the words of Joseph. Now, when you go out preaching the gospel, when you go out telling people, hey, Jesus is alive and he's Lord, what do you do? Do you just tell them in your own words? No, because the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what do you do? You tell them in Jesus' words. You tell them in God's words. Just like they went, just like the disciples were sent out and they went out and preached the gospel and they preached the word of God. We, when we go out today as disciples as well, we go out and we preach, hey, Jesus is yet alive and he is Lord and we preach the word of God. You must have the word of God in order to be saved. You have to. Why? Because Jesus said... The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Your words are not alive. Your, let me break something to you. Your words aren't that special. You know, your words, my words aren't that special, right? The only thing good about a preacher is the fact that he gets up and he reads and he's, and, and, you know, and expounding the word of God is important. But what I love and the types of sermons that I love are sermons that are packed with Bible. There's just tons of Bible in the sermons where I'm just hearing the word of God over and over and over and over and over again. Right? Because the Word of God is powerful. The Word of God is full of majesty, the Bible says. So when they went to preach the gospel, what did they do? They went, I'm sorry, well, it was the gospel, good news. Uh, Joseph's brethren, they went and they gave this good news. They told it in Joseph's words. Now, what happens if someone believes what we tell them? What will happen to that person? What, what, what do they receive? What do we always tell them? They receive eternal life. You know, their spirit revives. Now, what does it say happened to ja Joseph? Or, I'm sorry, Jacob. Goodness sakes here. What does it say happens? It says, the last phrase, their last clause of the verse 27, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. So they came and they told the words of Joseph and they were sent from him that tell him I am yet alive and I am Lord. I am governor, right? And what happened? It says his spirit revived. Revived. What does that mean? It means it came back alive. He was given life, right? Like the Bible says in Ephesians 2, and you hath he quickened who were dead in your trespasses, trespasses and your sins. What happened? When you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you put your faith and you believed, hey, Jesus is yet alive, and you have to believe, yes, that he's Lord. He said, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. You believe he's Lord, you put your faith in him, you believe that he's, that he's alive and that he resurrected, you put your faith in the good news, what happens? Your spirit revives. Amen. Just like Jacob's did just right here. Just like when he heard that Joseph was alive, his spirit revived, right? And then it says in verse number 29, it says, And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. It's a good ending. And then, it says, and then he makes this statement, I will go and see him before I die. I'm sure that was great news to Jacob. I'm sure that was great news. Of course, he loved Jacob. He adored Jacob. He was his favorite son. You can see the, 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 the you know, uh, extreme favoritism that he showed toward his son, uh, uh, Joseph, right? I, I said Jacob over and over again. I do that sometimes, right? His uh, favoritism that he showed towards Joseph, that Jacob showed towards uh, Joseph. Now, do you think that he liked this news, or do you think that it was just like, eh, it's okay? I'm sure he loved it, right? I'm sure it was great news. You know, we go out soul winning and sometimes people aren't that interested. Sometimes it, you know, it's like, are you listening? Could you even hear what I'm telling you? 
You're going to die and you're going to burn in hell forever. You're a sinner and you've done filthy things and you know it and you deserve a punishment for it. And sometimes people just aren't phased, right? But sometimes you tell people and what happens? And they believe it, right? And you can tell that they understand the good news. You can understand, hey, this is great news. That's why we go soul winning right there. That's why I go soul winning. You know what will happen? Sometimes you'll go to 10, 15 doors and they don't understand how good of news it is. They don't realize like, hey, this is great news. You know what? Their spirit doesn't revive. You know, maybe they don't put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They actually don't believe it. They don't put their faith in the good news and trust Jesus. But you got to keep knocking those doors. you got to keep going. And you know what you do? You find that one guy who, hey, this is good news. The son is alive, right? The Son of God is alive. Just like Jacob said, my son is alive. It is enough. You know what? And we knock on doors all the time. You know, hey, it's hard to get people into church. It's super hard to get people into church. Everybody knows. Every pastor I've ever talked to, when they talk about the early years and early stages of their church, they talk about it being like torment. Because they're just fixated on trying to fill people in the pews. But you know what? It's the same concept. You got to keep knocking the doors. You might knock 15 doors until you get somebody saved, right? Well, you may knock a bunch of doors until you get them to come down to Egypt too. Until you, and I, I realize Egypt is a picture of the world. It's normally opposite, but not in this case. What, what's he going to do? He gets saved, but he's also going to pack everything up and he's going to come down with them. He's going to go down there with you know the shepherd, right? He's going to go down there with them. So that's what we have to do. We have to be consistent. We have to keep knocking the doors to get people saved, but we got to also keep knocking the doors to get people in church. They're both important. But we need to also make sure that, you know, because we put a lot of focus on getting people into church because it's a new church. You're building the church. We're trying to figure everything out. We, not, we need to make sure that we don't lose sight of the reason why we're here. You know, the reason why this church is in Jacksonville, the goal of this church and vision of this church is to get people saved. That's the purpose of the church. So, hey, it can become frustrating that the church is small, you know, but here, this is, you need, what you need to do is not, you know, you need to not, you know, allow your, 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 your sight to get off of the goal, right? You need to make sure that you stay focused on the end goal. And what is it? To get people saved. I don't care if this church stays the same size until I die if I'm able to knock this entire city. Of course, I would prefer to, to, for this church to grow, but that is not my number one goal. You know, I want to help people, but I can't drag them here. I want to help people change their lives, and I want to, help, I want to teach people the Bible. I want people to you know, become a disciple of Christ and, and, and learn the virtues and all the good principles and the wisdom of God's Word, but I can't drag them here, right? I can send them a wagon, right? I guess the wagon would be like the church bus. You know, we can get a, a, you know, a church bus at some point and send them a wagon like Joseph did. But hey, they, you know, they may still may, may not come. You can't force them to come, but you know what you can at least do? Let me at least go tell them the good news. Jacob still had to make the decision to go down to Egypt, didn't he? Of course, it's providential and everything, but you know, God doesn't override people's will. Jacob still had to make the decision. Israel still had to choose. I'm going to go down to Egypt. You know, I'm going to go there with Joseph. I'm going to go with all of the brethren together and gather together with all the brethren. But even if he wouldn't have, even if those people don't come to church, their soul and their spirit being revived is good enough for me. Just those people getting saved. I'll be happy with that if that's, if that's all that is, is going to come from it. Amen. I'll be happy with people getting saved. That is why I'm here. That is why I came to Jacksonville. That is the reason why this church is in Jacksonville. It's for the gospel's sake. It's for the good news' sake. Sometimes our goals can kind of shift when we get focused on something. Hey, I want to build the church. I trust that the church will build. I believe that, that of course, God uses man and there are things that we have to do as well. I don't buy into this philosophy that well, God will just do all of it. There's no area in the Bible where God just does every single thing in the Christian life. You have, you have to read your Bible. You have to memorize your Bible. God did not carry the children of Israel through the wilderness, right? He led them, right? And he leads us. So we still have to, to, to do things in order to get people into the church, of course. But hey, you know, I believe that God will help us and he will get us where we need to be and he will build the church. I fully believe that. 
I, 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 you know, I am positive of that. I feel positive of that. But here's the thing, even if it doesn't, don't be focused on only that. Even if that doesn't happen, that's not why we're here. We're here to preach the gospel to Jacksonville. We're here to preach the gospel to the city of Jacksonville. We're here to give the good news. Jesus is yet alive. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Jesus is living. Hey, I got some good news for you. He's not dead. He's alive. You know what can happen? They put their faith in that. Their spirit can revive. That's good news. I love hearing people getting, I love seeing people getting saved. I love when you guys come back and you're like, hey, we got four saved, five saved. Hey, I'm happy when there's one saved. You know, of course, just like the parable where Jesus talks about, you know, what man, what, what man among you having 99 sheep and one going astray and going into the wilderness wouldn't leave those 99 and go find that one? That's the attitude we need to have. Every soul we need to treat precious. Now, as if it is precious, because it is. God cares about each and every last one of them. That's what we need to not lose sight of is soul winning, is getting people saved. That's the most important thing. You know, getting people into the kingdom of heaven, getting people into the kingdom of God. You are affecting people's eternity. Stop and think about that. We go to our jobs every day and you, you lose sight of this. You are affecting. These people, there will be a time. You don't know what age that they will be. You don't know where they're, where they're going to be when this happens, but there will be a time when every, each person dies. Those people you go to the door and knock on the door, the people that reject the gospel, each one of them are going to die at a moment. Some moment in time, right? There's going to be an obituary. There's going to be a funeral for that specific person. And they are either going to go to heaven and they are going to be there forever or they are going to go to hell and be there forever. It's horrible. So we need to go to their doors and we need to knock on their doors and we need to give them the good news that Jesus is yet alive. Amen. Preach the gospel to them and, and pray that, hey, they believe it. And if they do, their spirit will revive. Let's not lose focus of the reason why we're in Jacksonville. And that is to preach the good news that Jesus is yet alive. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you, dear God, for the gospel and how great it is. We thank you for all the parallels in the Bible. And, the, and uh, we thank you for all the symbolism, dear Lord. Uh, we thank you and we're so thankful that, that you are alive.